Hello. This set of notes is going to be covering the topic of the cell membrane and transport of materials in and out of the cell. So let's go over the outline. So in today's notes, we're gonna start with an overview of the cell membrane structure. Then we're gonna just do an overview of its function and purpose. We are going to zoom in on the two types of cell transport, which are active and passive. And underneath the passive transport, we're gonna discuss a concept called tonicity. So you can pause at each slide and fill in the guided notes found in the description below, or you can watch these notes straight through. So let's begin. So on my slides here, I have made a very simple uh, image recreation of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is the outer layer of all cells and has this basic structure across all cell types. So plant cells, bacteria cells, animal cells, they have a lot of different components and maybe even extra layers on top of the cell membrane, but they all have the similar setup of what the cell membrane looks like. So the cell membrane, the majority of it is made up of these purple things you see, and this is called the phospholipid bilayer. So if we break down those words, we have phospho for a phosphate group, lipid, which is a type of molecule. These are our fats and our oil molecules. And then bilayer, meaning a double layer. So you can see here that we have these layers down here and these layers across, and this layer across the top. So when we zoom in on a phospholipid, we have the head and the tail, because it kind of looks like a head and kind of looks like a tail. So the tail is what we call hydrophobic. So remember what I just said about lipids. There are fats and oils. If you try to take some oil and pour it in a cup with water, they're not going to mix. They will always separate out. And that's because lipids do not mix with water. Their structure is nonpolar and they don't want to touch something polar like water. So this tail here, you'll notice, is going to be on the inside of the layer. It's not going to be flipped out and touching the watery environment of the cell or the watery environment of outside the cell in whatever organism or environment this cell may be in. So this is called the hydrophobic tail. So it's not terrified of water, but it's definitely not going to go near it. The head on the other hand is the head on the other hand is called hydrophilic. This means that it likes water. So this will be coming in contact with the watery environment of the cytoplasm inside the cell and the watery environment outside of the cell. And this is what gives us this basic structure of the cell membrane. The chemistry of the head and tail keeps the tails pointed inwards and the heads outwards, giving us this bilayer. We also need to have two layers because if we only had one, these tails would be exposed to a watery environment and would be constantly moving, trying to get away from it. Embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, we have a lot of proteins. These are my colorful blobs I've added, as well as cholesterol. So these are going to provide uh, some means of structure, some more solid comp components in this lipid bilayer. And we're gonna talk more about the proteins because they are very helpful for transportation of molecules. So, the general function of the cell membrane is to control what comes in and goes out of the cell. This is going to keep what we call homeostasis, a balance of the internal environment of a living cell or even a living organism. So the cell membrane is described as a semi-permeable membrane. Permeable means to pass and semi means some. So some things can pass, but not everything. So this is what's going to help regulate 
the size of our cells, the nutrients, the levels of things in and outside of the cell to keep the organism in balance and keep the cell itself in balance. So for things to move in or out of the cell, we have two types of transport. The first one is called passive transport. This does not require any energy from the cell. The cell does not have to perform any work or movement. The energy molecule known as ATP does not have to be used. And this is because molecules are going to be doing something called moving down a concentration gradient. So concentration, along with how well you focus, also means how compact or how close things are, how many of something there is. So a high concentration means there is a high amount of molecules or substances in an area. A low concentration would mean that there's not as many. So molecules naturally move from high to low. If you think about lighting a candle or plugging in an air freshener in a room, the molecules are gonna be concentrated most heavily at the candle or at the air freshener. So if you go directly up to it and inhale, it's gonna have a really strong scent. But as you move further and further away, it's going to get less strong, the scent, because it's dispersing throughout the room. It's starting where it's heavily concentrated and it's going to expand into the room and spread out the scent molecules. Our cells work in a similar way. If we have a high amount of something outside of our cells, for example, oxygen, and there's a lower amount of oxygen molecules inside our cells, those molecules are going to passively go through the phospholipid bilayer, sort of like these blue dots here, and come into our cells. If we have a high level of something inside the cell and it needs to go out, this high amount of molecules is going to naturally move and leave the cell. So going down your concentration gradient is called going down because it's like a slide. You go from the high to the low, the natural order of things. There's two types of passive transport called diffusion and osmosis. And we'll talk about why those are different in a later slide. So passive transport requires no energy and has things moving in and out of the cell. But we also have what's called active transport, which does require energy from the cell. Work will have to be done. ATP will have to be expended in order for active transport to occur. In this one, molecules are going to move against a concentration gradient. It's gonna be like taking all of that nice candle scent smell that has gone around the room and trying to push it back to the candle, which would be pretty impossible. In our cells though, we have the materials to, if we have a low amount and need to push it into an area with high amount, we can do the work and have that happen. So this is going the opposite of the slide, low to high. So if you've ever tried climbing up a slide, it's more difficult than going down and requires more work and energy on your part. There are some types of active transport, endocytosis, exocytosis, phagocytosis, and pinocytosis. And so we're gonna focus on active transport uh, first and then go into passive. So in active transport, we're gonna focus on those proteins I was talking about in the structure. So there are what we call carrier proteins and they're going to use energy to move materials across the cell. So a protein is going to maybe have to change its shape and it's going to have to accept molecules and then push them out to the other side. You can see here we have only three of this molecule while over here we have seven. And so this protein is going against the concentration gradient to move these molecules into the cell. 
Some other types of active transport include endo and exocytosis. So endocytosis, we're using the cell membrane to form a vesicle and bring material into the cell, sort of like forming a mouth with the membrane itself. Obviously, this is going to take movement and signals and is going to take energy. So this is a form of active transport to take something in rather large into the cell. Exocytosis is the reverse of that. We're going to use the cell membrane and form sort of more of a bubble that pops out, another vesicle, and this is going to release materials from the cell. And again, this is going to require energy and is a form of active transport. Our immune cells, like our white blood cells, do a form of active transport called phagocytosis. This is considered cell eating. So immune cells are going to eat or consume materials, including pathogens. Pathogens are anything that make us sick or give us symptoms of feeling unwell. So your bacteria, viruses, parasites, your germs, essentially. So they are going to sort of Pac-Man style go and actually consume and bring in these infectious materials. This is because immune cells have a lot of lysosomes, which if you've watched my cell structure and function video or reviewed cells in class, lysosomes have enzymes that are gonna break down and digest things that we need to get rid of. So these immune cells can actually consume and bring something in, and then they have the tools to dissolve and break it down so that it can no longer harm us. The last one is called pinocytosis. This is going to be cell drinking. So if the cell is using active transport and forming a vesicle to take in liquid. So I kind of made it a blue vesicle to give the idea that it is a liquid moving into the cell. So this is the idea of active transport. So now we're gonna zoom in on passive transport. In passive transport, we have two types. The first is diffusion. This is the definition I gave for passive transport earlier. It's the passive movement of materials, or in this case, solu solutes, through the phospholipid bilayer from high to low concentration. So this is going to be any gases, solid materials, nutrients, things of that nature. There is something called facilitated diffusion. This is when we still have a passive movement of materials, but it's going to go through a protein instead of through the phospholipid bilayer. So we call this a channel protein. So it forms this connection, this channel, between the outside and inside of the cell for the materials to slide through. They are still not using any energy to do this. It is still diffusion. It's just going to use a little bit of help. It might be too large to squeeze through the phospholipid bilayer. Now, osmosis is the same thing, but it's specific to the diffusion of water. So anything that's not water is diffusion. When we talk about water, we're talking about the passive transport of, or sorry, when we're talking about osmosis, we're talking about the passive transport of water from a high concentration to a lower concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. So water on a waterfall going from a high level to a low level is not considered osmosis. You have to be passing through a semi-permeable membrane such as the cell membrane in order for it to be called osmosis. And this is important because all living organisms need water and water makes up a lot of the cell and body of most organisms. So osmosis allows the cell to keep balance in its internal environment with the amount of water going in or out of the cell. And this is what takes us to tonicity. So a solution, which is a mixture of water and a solute, a material that is dissolved within the water, 
So it's that solution's ability to move the water in or out of the cell using osmosis. And so it's important to know the types of solutions that a cell can encounter and how a cell will respond in this environment. So we have a hypotonic solution. So hypotonic is the first type of solution that a cell could encounter. So hypotonic means that the solution has a lower concentration of solute or particles compared to the other solution, which in this case is the cell's cytoplasm. This means that it has a higher concentration of water. There is more water molecules in comparison to the dissolved solute molecule. So what happens is water wants to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So the water is going to move from the solution that is hypotonic into the cell. Now, since water is passively moving, water will be moving in both directions, but a higher volume of it will be going into the cell rather than out of the cell. This will cause the cell to swell or expand. In animal cells, this can be dangerous because we only have the cell membrane. We don't have a cell wall. So if we fill with too much water, you could potentially have your cell burst. And this would be uh, a cause of water poisoning. You would have to drink an insane amount of water, so it is extremely rare to do that, but it is possible. Plant cells, on the other hand, tend to prefer hypotonic solutions because they have a cell wall. And so lots of water going in and filling that cell and expanding it puts pressure on the cell wall and makes the plant nice and rigid and sturdy. So I like to think hypo-hippo. In a hypotonic solution, your cells get nice and big like a hippo. The next solution is hypertonic. This is a solution that has a higher concentration of solute compared to the solution of the cell's cytoplasm. So if it has a higher ratio of solute to water, that means the water concentration is low. So what happens is, since we want to go from high to low, the water from inside our cells, from the cytoplasm, will leave at a higher rate than any water that's coming in. So the water is going to rush out, causing the cell to shrink and shrivel. This is why salt water would be so dangerous to drink. It would actually dehydrate you much faster than not drinking anything because you're putting your cells in a hypertonic solution, basically pulling the water out of your cells. So hypertonic can dehydrate and take moisture away from the cells. Last but not least is our Goldilocks solution. This is called isotonic. This is a solution that has the same concentration compared to another solution, in this case, the cell's cytoplasm. So in this case, water will be entering and exiting at an equal rate, keeping the cell in perfect balance or in homeostasis. And this is ideal for animal cells. Since we don't have a cell wall, we really don't want to be swelling to the point of bursting. And we don't want to be dehydrated and having our cells shrink. So the cell here is in the perfect environment where the water outside is an equal concentration to the water inside the cell. So that is the overview I have for the cell membrane and transportation of materials in and out of the cell. If you have any questions or would like me to expand further on any topic, please let me know in the comments and I hope this helped you better understand our cells.